Hi again. Welcome to another installment of Letters to No One. Uh, and this one is going to be a couple exchanges back and forth with someone who I have worked with in the past. Um, he reached out to me uh, about an issue which is going to be maybe a little bit controversial. Um, it's something that we don't talk about very often. It comes up occasionally, um, but I think is really important. And it's something that is important to me because this was definitely something that impacted my life. And it's the question of, do we take a really ascetic approach to the awakening path or, um, you know, how much pressure, how much renunciation, what is renunciation? Um, you know, is it okay even after breaking four and five where we've lost craving and aversion to still enjoy things, to still look forward to doing things? Um, do we just become sort of blank, mindless automata? Um, you know, there are a lot of uh, misunderstandings about this whole process and um, also a lot of what I see as being um, sort of religious asceticism which has gotten into it um, because of you know years of, of that sort of thing being part of the awakening or enlightening pa enlightenment path um, so as you'll hear in the um, in the letter you know I too went through uh, years on and off of um, asceticism where I would deny myself any um, you know any sort of pleasure or you know really, and it wasn't just denial, it was feeling guilt about any, um, any indulgence in anything which was um, pleasurable in any way, but also um, guilt that there was even an idea of wanting to do that thing or an idea of liking something. Uh, so it was really taken to quite an extreme. Um, and I think it's deeply unhealthy. And as you'll hear in the letter that I responded with, or one of the letters that I responded with, that it's actually um, really antithetical to what we're doing here and to the approach and the insights that we are looking to have when we do this kind of work. So uh, that being the case, let us, uh, let us dig in. He wrote to me first. Hey, Todd. I'm here wondering about the difference between restlessness and the genuine human need for activity, absorption, and stimulation. I'm worried there's a lot of needless shame and tension attached to these needs and desires in me, perhaps because I'm conditioned to see things from the standpoint of wanting to be able to live ascetically, fully mindful, and not needing stimulation like a Buddhist monk or the Buddha. So I try to be satisfied just meditating, laying around, and taking walks for long periods of the day, but there's a pressure that builds up to connect, have fun, be engaged in something interesting, etc. And then the inner struggle begins. Under the assumption is just the energy of restlessness and unskillful outward reaching. This also connects to the question I had before about renunciation and whether it naturally develops over maturity, like you said, or if it's more of an internal discipline, like I thought the Buddha suggested. I welcome your thoughts on all of this if you're inclined. Um, and then, you know, closing. I said, Hey man, I completely resonate with this question. It's something I have struggled with for years. First of all, on a practical level, you're a young guy, and it's part of our biology to want to explore life, collect experiences, grow the brain, figure out what moves you, procreate, and do things with the energy that you have at this stage of development. If you fight against that, you are literally fighting nature, and it's an uphill battle all the way. I'm not saying that it's not good to have some discipline, but we need moderation and a reasonable approach. Remember, the Buddha did the ascetic thing too, but preached against it in the end. It didn't bring him enlightenment any more than wine, women, and song, but he experienced all of those things first. He had to live both of the extremes in order to find the middle way. Pranilla is better at remembering specific suttas, so I'm not going to be helpful on this with the actual sources regarding the natural unfolding of renunciation, but I have found personally as well that the purification happens on its own when you are no longer identified. 
The issue is that you're creating an identity who can force yourself to live a certain way. Look into that feeling of volition and being able to make rules and to push yourself to follow them. And nested in there is a moral belief that feeling a pleasant sensation is inherently a bad thing, while feeling hunger pangs and physical pain is good because you know you aren't enjoying it. First of all, this is an identified view based on your own arbitrary rules about what constitutes moral goodness and evil. But it's also disingenuous, because in actuality, you must also be deriving some pleasure from the satisfaction of abstinence. Look at what you get from the idea that you are the kind of person who is strong enough, with enough willpower, and wise enough to be able to only eat fruit, or to abstain from sex, or to survive hunger and exhaustion. There is a subtle ego flex in doing all of this. I went through those phases of feeling like I should refrain from all sexual activity, music, TV, foods, essentially everything pleasurable, because I felt like that was going to cut out the desire and craving. And I was successful at abstaining for periods, but like the Buddha, I don't recommend it. When you think about it, it's completely illogical. Has a person in a prison camp rooted out desire and aversion because they are only given water and sawdust to eat? Of course not. If they get released, they're going home to binge on all of the foods they've been dreaming of for as long as they've been locked up. Deprivation isn't helping remove desire and aversion. To do that, we need to be able to experience it without attachments. Take it or leave it. You can eat cooked foods, grains, beans, etc., and then notice if there is craving for more than you need. And if you suddenly don't have access to it, do you get upset and say things like, I was really looking forward to that, and now I'm so disappointed? I told someone in a one-to-one recently that you can go to a concert that you like, and it's not a problem. What would be a problem is if you can't make it at that last minute, and that conflict between what you want to happen and what actually happened starts a spiral of negative thoughts, complaints, wishing it was otherwise, and fighting with reality. If you can say, it's okay, I wasn't meant to go, and really feel it inside, then there's no issue. The only problem with positive sensations is the attachment to them. If you need them to maintain a state of equilibrium, then your happiness is at the mercy of the universe providing the things you want. But you're becoming just as attached to negative feelings, which is defeating the purpose. If you can cultivate the state of equanimity with whatever arises, then you're golden, regardless of what you encounter. It's good to know that you can deal with hardship just fine, but it's also necessary to know that you can have a healthy relationship to chocolate or beer. If you're abstaining because you know you can't trust yourself, then there's work there to be done, and you're just bypassing it by not allowing yourself to be around it. And we can do that work without needing to punish or restrain ourselves like you're doing. Take the middle way. Be skillful about your discernment. Listen to the body. If it's hungry, feed it healthy, nourishing food. If it's tired, sleep. If it needs exercise, let it exercise. And also, be kind in your exercise. I spent years punish walking, where I would walk for hours a day, but was doing it with the pretense of being healthy, losing weight, and burning off the shameful calories I'd eaten that day. No matter what you're doing, we need to be skillful about it. We also need socialization as a species, and there's nothing wrong with communication. Even monks socialize. Doing anything else is pure ego. You are strengthening the urge that you're trying to dig out. And if you do this, get very clear on why you are doing what you do and what you think you need versus what you really need. Then yes, renunciation of the unnecessary things happens naturally, all on its own. Renunciation is a product of clear seeing, not forcefulness. There are monks, especially in the Theravadan tradition, that live with an insane number of rules but it's just a way of simplifying their life so they don't need to deal with taxes and relationship arguments and figuring out what to cook for dinner. It can be helpful to have periods of intense practice like that, of course, but being sequestered for life isn't proof of the depth of your practice. 
driving through rush hour traffic without losing your shit is. Keep meditating if it feels right. Inquire all the time if it resonates with you. But please also enjoy your life while you can. The shame attached to anything but sleeping, meditating, and eating as little fruit as possible is a dead end. The Buddha wasn't condoning shame. It's more identification. Drop the one who can control eating habits. Drop the one who is going to get the trophy of enlightenment if only he suffers enough. Drop the one who feels so badly about himself that he doesn't feel he deserves to live the life that he has. Drop the one who conceptualizes and criticizes and judges and needs for things to be different than they are. Drop the one who can be considered moral or immoral, good or bad, right or wrong. Buddhism is wonderful. Veganism is wonderful. But there is a healthy middle way with all of it that is compassionate not only to others, but also to you. Compassion to everything or compassion to nothing. If you wouldn't force someone else to live under the restrictions you create for yourself, why would you force yourself to do it? Check with what's underneath it. Fear? Ego? The need for reassurance that you are the strong, wise, awakened one that you don't really believe? Be honest with yourself and see what motivation is at the bottom. That was a lot, but it's a big, important topic, and it's one that can really ruin your physical and mental health. It creates anorexia, body dysmorphia, all sorts of anxieties and compulsions, and so many feelings of guilt and shame that reinforce the self while making life miserable. That's not the middle way, my friend. I say all of this out of compassion and love. I've been there, and it was not a benefit. Losing the attachments while still living in the world of experience, both pleasurable and painful, and remaining equanimous with both is where liberation is. Much love. Um, it seemed like I had said everything that I had to say about the topic in that, but it turned out that I did not. Um, it's a deep topic, and as I said, it's one that did lead me into years of body dysmorphia and anorexia and... Um, you know, shame cycles of all sorts. So he wrote back to me that he was going to do more self-parenting work, but that he was no longer able to really enjoy things, probably because of his disenchantment practices where he tried to see through his enjoyment with things in order to lose his attachment to them. So I responded back. I'm so glad to hear that you're going to take this to heart and dig into it. Yeah, I do also understand exactly what you mean about your lack of enjoyment with things and it being the product of our disenchantment work. I too did a lot of that stuff to try to dissolve attachment to the body, attraction to other people's bodies, addictions to food, and all of the other pleasurable things in life. And we can say that it worked in that I lost a lot of the enjoyment I'd had. The perception of a pleasurable sensation in the body got broken down into its constituent parts and lost the pleasurable overlay. But this led to feelings being muted and only half real in a lackluster, mediocre sort of way. And I've come to recognize that the way I went about it was not skillful, nor was it kind or compassionate. I don't think that a muting of the senses was ever the intended outcome of the work of removing attachment to impermanent objects. If it was, then the best way to stop being attracted to the sight of a woman would be to blind yourself. As I said before, we can absolutely enjoy things without attachment when they are viewed in the right way. It is our wrong view that makes them into something desirable or loathsome. I would say I was able to eventually redevelop some of the enjoyment that I destroyed, though only partially. Things aren't as enjoyable or deeply felt as they once were, but it doesn't need to be that way to live a life free from attachment. I did develop from it a layer of insight where I learned not to cling to things because I know that ultimately they are not fulfilling or permanent, nor anything other than what I make them out to be. But there's a deeper insight that I was missing that makes it feel like this disenchantment work is just the opposite extreme of hedonism. In other words, there is no inherent goodness or badness in a chocolate bar or watching a movie. Every ounce of moral judgment 
and the ideas about the pros and cons of engaging with it is purely a biased story of my own creation from my personal perspective of what I think is right or wrong, healthy or unhealthy. In and of themselves, chocolate bars and movies are completely empty of their own nature and empty of any value at all. Whether we enjoy them or detest them all speaks to our own personal hang-ups about them and conceptualizations of what we have decided they are. We are literally creating them and our relationship to them. And this shows where our actual attachment lives, because both positive and negative judgments about them are equally conditioned and untrue. And both are creating something out of nothing. Again, I would say that the proper renunciation is when the chocolate bar is no longer an unhealthy junk food, nor a symbol of decadence and indulging. It's when it becomes something completely free from our projection and ideas of what it is, and it's free to just appear as it does. And your interaction with it, if you do, can be as equally free from judgment, need, attachment, or aversion. The more we push things away, the more we reinforce their inherent thingness that doesn't really exist. And with that, the more we create a me who is pushing away at the thing. The me who needs to resist the tempting allure of the chocolate bar creates two things, a self and an other, and a relationship between them that doesn't exist. It gives the inert chocolate bar that is just cocoa and sugar, or more properly, molecules or subatomic particles, a quality, almost a personality of its own, where clearly it has none. And this can be seen with everything we decide we need to push away or pull towards us. And again, this doesn't mean that you can't or shouldn't try the chocolate bar, or get into a relationship when you feel like you're ready, or go to a concert. You can recognize the unique experience of whatever it is, free from all of the conceptual overlays that portray it as a forbidden taboo or an ultimate place of fulfillment. Both of those are equally untrue. Just enjoy the experience for what it is, without the need for it to continue, the quest for more, or the sadness when it's gone. Every appearance is fascinating and lovely as it arises, and whatever replaces it in the next moment is equally fascinating and lovely. There's no point in clinging to things that are impermanent and mourning what has just gone, but there's also no point in turning your back on a beautiful sunset because you don't trust yourself to not get attached to it. That's just bypassing, and it shows where the real work on attachment needs to be done. On a more mundane level, are you sure that the disinterest in things isn't also coming from depression? What you describe also sounds like anhedonia, where you just don't feel any sense of enjoyment from anything, even those things you used to love. And that is definitely not an awakened state, just one of depressed exhaustion and unhealthy detachment from life. Does it sound like this might be part of it for you? Either way, I think this self-love work will be huge for helping both of these aspects. The shame, depression, self-loathing, and urge to restrict and control are all rooted from that same source. It's the lack of self-love and the wrong view of who you really are. Watch out for any false images of yourself that say, I am always blank. If you have any sort of negative view of yourself, your habits, your personality, your appearance, anything, you need to see from where that image is arising and why it is being believed. Are you referring to memories or other images in the mind to give you a mental shorthand for who you are? Are you relying on an uncomfortable sensation in the body to say that this is me and there's something wrong here? Be super curious about how you are even creating a personality or belief in anyone consistent enough to be a shameful person or an unattractive person or a person with a terrible personality or any other negative label. These judgments are all serving a purpose for you. What is that purpose? What are these self-judgments keeping you from seeing? And what would be left if they suddenly disappeared? They are only thoughts, so can't they just disappear? And what is actually here without them? 
feel free to keep me posted. I'm invested in seeing how this plays out. Sending much love and good luck with your inquiries. So that was, um, that was a lot for him. And again, it came from this place of really deep compassion and recognition because I've been there and done it all. So I remember what it was like to live life that way. And I saw all of the dead ends that it brought me to and all of the shame and all of the re reification and re solidification of self that was happening back in those days, just creating a sense of a person who was wrong and deeply flawed and shameful and needed to do something different to be able to be better enlightened, less burdened by his conscience. Um, there was just so, 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 so much in there. Um, and to this extent, I also want to read one other short little email that I had written to somebody else who had um, made a comment about uh, drinking beer. But he wrote me this, this kind of joking but slightly prodding little question. Um, how are those beer preferences going? Third Zen patriarch can't have been much of an alehouse frequenter. And uh, I said, as for the Zen patriarch, did you ever hear the old Zen story about the master who liked to drink? Another monk went to him and confronted him about it. The master said, one who doesn't drink isn't human. The other got huffy and said, so then what is he? To which the old master replied, a Buddha. So the occasional pint's okay. I'm not a Buddha yet. It's actually a really interesting thing regarding Fetter 3 with its rites and rituals and Fetter 7 with its creating something out of nothing. It's the identification with doing things or refraining from doing things for a purpose. For instance, I had a lot of that identification with being a vegan who intermittent fasted and only ate organic foods with no sugar or flour, etc. And when I got to Denmark, it all fell away because I saw how much fixation and rigidity there was in that abstinence. Still vegan because that's an ethical thing as well as just logical in terms of environment and bodily functioning. But the body definitely feels a lot better on the healthier vegan diet I'd been on. And once we get home and have access to all of that again, I'm sure the diet will go back in that direction. But currently, there's no guilt or hang-up associated with a pint or a slice of vegan carrot cake because there's no identification with the one who must abstain. I think that's the benefit slash risk of formal vows. There's great practicality in not becoming an alcoholic. But going to the extreme of considering it to be a moral failing to have a drop of wine touch the lips is completely filled with identification and a Christian-style morality and creation of form out of nothing. Again, Fetter 7. There's nothing in the body or the beer that has any sort of moral weight to it, and yet we create a whole narrative of shame and guilt around the meeting of the two. Fascinating, isn't it? I actually went through many years where I literally couldn't bring myself to try even a sip of beer because it felt like I was breaking a vow and doing something really wrong. That's no longer there anymore. Now a beer is just a beverage free of all of the old moral weight. Sorry for the lengthy ramble, but I think our moralization of everyday things is quite a self-defeating toxic trait and also a really interesting topic on the path to de-identification. And I'm not saying to you know, be unhealthy with anything that you're doing. Obviously, if you have uh, suffered from alcoholism or drug addiction, I'm not saying to go back to trying them again. Uh, please, you know, be safe and don't do that. Um, it's, it's, it's not about indulging and it's not about using something as a crutch. Um, all of that is the wrong purpose. What we're talking about is just being able to interact with things in a way free from all of the addictions, the clingings, the attachments, the cravings, but also the pushing away and the uh, fear and the resistance based off of a sense of um, self-created morality or self-created values, um, which is not a universal thing which has nothing to do with the actual chocolate bar or the actual can of beer. It's just an object. I just want you to be um, kind and compassionate with yourself when you are doing awakening work that so that you're not forcing yourself to suffer 
on the path to reducing suffering. It's all an unnecessary complication, and it's just keeping you further and further from the experience of what really is without all of the thoughts and labels and delusions, because you're just creating one more layer of value and judgment and conceptualization and attachment, um, whether you are clinging to something or pushing it away. So with that, I will leave you uh, another very long letters to no one. Um, please continue to feel free to write to me. I will continue to anonymize and um, respond back as best I can in as timely a fashion as possible. Um, thank you again for watching, for writing, for participating. Um, it's absolutely amazing uh, seeing the interactions that happen. And uh, again, please just be kind and compassionate with yourself and don't do anything. Don't force yourself to do anything that you wouldn't force somebody else to do when you are doing this kind of work. So if you have any questions, further questions about this, please feel free to comment. Um, otherwise, have a lovely day. Happy inquiring and be well. Thank you.